I've seen a lot through the fire department because I've been on the rescue squad for years. But uh, that smell coming up the mountain when the wind blew up the mountain was just bad, terrible. And it, and every now and then when we see, I see a dead body, I smell that smell again. It reminds you of certain incidents. On uh, December 11th, 1991, there were a whole bunch of um, high executives of the Bruno Incorporated Company who were on a Christmas tour of their facilities in and around the South. Um, and they were stopping off in Rome to visit one of the facilities here. Um, and then they took off in the morning and they didn't make it to their next destination because they hit Lavender Mountain. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, there were, there were nine people on the plane. Two of them were pilots and the rest of them were all like high executives of the Bruno Company. And um, two of the people on, two of the passengers were brothers. So um, it was kind of like, and they were the chairman and vice chairman. So it was kind of like a family run company and they both died in the plane crash, so. Every single one of those people died? Yeah, all, they all died on impact. Oh, jeez. Yeah, there, were no, there was no way they could have survived. There have been other plane crashes on Barry's campus, but this is one that had the most casualties. So um, nine people. Nine and people. And it seems like the, it's probably like the most like real world impact as well, because yeah. how they were all like executives and stuff. Yeah, they were all like high executives of like a family run company. Like two of them were brothers, yeah. and like the the son of Angelo had to take over his dad as chairman after he died in the mm -hmm. crash. So we're about to go see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna go up and go see where they crashed, and hopefully there's some parts of the plane left we can look at. See? That's so cool. So I heard about the 1991 plane crash from my work supervisor at my old job. She told me that there was a plane crash and several people died and I thought it was really interesting that, you know, at the two years I had been at Barry at the time, I had never heard anyone talk about this. So I, I was just intrigued by the idea that there was a plane crash what almost 30 years ago but no one ever talked about it. So when I started working at Viking Fusion I thought that a documentary about the plane crash that happened in 1991 would be really interesting. Students at Barry could learn about a part of their history that hasn't really been talked about. Because this plane crash happened on Barry's campus that means that we can actually go to the location of the plane crash. So on September 23rd a couple of members of the productions team Jack, Wyatt, Eric, and I, uh, we went up hiking and to try and find the plane crash site. Please calm down and leave the adventuring to me. <laughs> well, I'm the fun director. So, like, I, That's I, included I, in my job title as well. Uh -huh. I'm the only one allowed to have fun, to <laughs> lead adventures, to do a number of things. It's just me. I was working for Floyd EMS that day. Uh, we happened to be on a call at Mount Berry Square Mall. Um, we just pulled up there and gotten out of the truck and we actually heard the jet powering up and it, it was really screaming hard and then all at once we heard a big loud boom. We didn't see it, we could just hear it. Uh, at the time I was a young firefighter and we were, I was downstairs cleaning at number one station and the deputy chief at the time come by me and he always grabbed me to go on calls and he said, uh, come go with me. And I said, I asked him, I said, uh, do I need my turnout gear? He said, yeah, you might order to bring it. We, we got notic notification from the county police that the fire department had arrived on scene at the crash site. And so I was in my office and the carrier people had the radio on in the office and I heard uh, that this, uh, a plane crash had occurred on Lavender Mountain. And then I find out as more time progresses that it's a rather serious, uh, not that a plane crash wouldn't be necessarily, but uh, that all stops have been pulled out and uh, emergency personnel, law enforcement, fire department, they're all, they're all on the way. From what I understand from the way that uh, um, NTSB report was referred to us was that uh, they had made a sweep around by their store at the Bruno store in West Rome and headed on a northerly path. Uh, when they did that, altimeter was not reset. It was about 500 feet off, uh, which instead of putting them over the mountain, put them into the side of the mountain. 
and we feel like the the scream from that we heard from the motors was the pilot had realized probably that he was getting into the trees and into the mountain and probably powered up and pulled back which causes a lot of yaw against the aircraft that's what causes it to, the engines and the wings to give a screaming noise is the yaw rates on and uh that we feel like that's probably what happened he realized at the last minute that uh that he was way too low and before he could correct and get up he was into the side of the mountain um, and you could tell that he was probably trying to do that because instead of the impact being down into the ground the impact was up the mountain um, so he was he was actively trying to correct his path so the passengers and crew landed in Rome at 820 in the, um, the Richard B. Russell Airport so they landed here at 8.20, um, and then the passengers left that airport, I assume, to go to the facility, check it out. They are supposed to come back at 9.15. They ended up coming back at 9.25, um, and then they didn't, like, take off until 9.37, which means that they were, like, 15 to, like, 20 minutes late. Um, and the report that I was looking at, um, some witnesses at the airport were saying that the passengers were concerned about being late and staying on schedule because they had, like... 11 facilities to visit in Huntsville, Alabama. So they were kind of like oh, on a wow. tight, really tight schedule. So they were running a little bit late. Neither the pilot or the first officer mentioned preparing a checklist or doing a pre takeoff or departure briefing. Um, based on the report that I read, they kind of just got in the plane and then left. Mm -hmm. um, and th there was no indication that the passengers were like pressuring the pilot to go quickly because they were running late but the pilot had been working for the company for many, many years. So it's probably, he was aware of their schedule and was concerned about like keeping on track. And so he may have forgone the checklist to kind of just get going. But with the sound coming off those mountains, it was really difficult to pinpoint where it was coming from. The dispatch started getting calls. They called us, but they didn't know where to send anybody. Um, there was no pinpoint location, so we all had to start kind of roving around, looking to see if we could make a determination of where it actually was at. Out that area, the Berry Hill landfill is there, and I think when the employees saw smoke, reported it, they kind of confirmed it. Already been, they knew that a, a plane was missing. Uh, it wasn't much longer we started getting calls from people that actually saw it, um, saw the jet coming low, uh, and some people that had heard it uh, from like the Texas Valley area and could actually tell where it was at. And uh, then we started making egress into the plane. There weren't students around. I was free at the time, didn't have class or any other obligations. I'm like, I need to, I need to cover this. I run home, get my equipment, and as I'm going home, I'm listening to coverage on the radio of this, what's occurred. And I've learned that they have blocked off all access uh, from mountain campus up Lavender Mountain and that they restricted any access at all except for emergency personnel. So I'm thinking to myself, how will I get access short of hiking up from the bottom? And that's quite a, and I remembered that I could go to Fouché Gap Road up the back side of Lavender Mountain and hike in on the trail that's right there. Uh, that's what I did. We just knew that there had been an airplane crash up there. Uh, Richard B. Russell then told us that it had been a private jet that had left from there, that it could be that plane because they had lost contact with it and couldn't raise it. Um, then we were suspect as, yeah, it, it could be that plane. Um, when they dispatched us out, it turned out to be in such a remote area that uh, the first crews went in and hiked through the woods up the mountain that way to the site. We went in and went up to the top of the mountain and come down the mountain to the site. While we was in route, we could see smoke coming from the mountain uh, and it wasn't a whole lot of smoke. Uh, so when we got to the base of the mountain, me and several firefighters started up the mountain and uh, me and another one arrived at the original crash site first. The firemen actually walked up to the crash site, reported in as the plane crash, and then that's how we got involved. It was a 
It was a hard journey getting there. It took us a little while to get on the scene. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good. Are you excited am, to hike? I am very excited to hike. I am prepared mentally, yet not physically, <laughs> for this hike. Did you grab me? I say when I can't drive anymore. Okay. <laughs> nice the road keeps yeah. Going, like, knocks down trees. All right, so I'm gonna put on my hat backwards. I'm gonna put on my my name tag. Come on, children, let's go. Let's go. We're ready to have some adventures. <laughs> we were on a little bit of a time crunch because the gates at the old mill closed at 6 p.m. and so we needed to get the truck out of the parking lot at the old mill before we could get trapped there. We need to hike this way along the kind of like reservoir hike slash snow loop. And then at this point we got to break off, figure out where that break off is. Um, and then go down the snow loop up and around, around here. And then the crash site should be around here somewhere. Um, so this will be about an hour and a half long hike. Now this in total is um, I think eight miles. So we're not gonna continue on with that eight miles i'm pretty sure we're just going to turn back around and go back down um and it is a level five hike according to barry so we are going to have fun this should be a grand old time we are experts the only issue is once we get up to the top where the crash light is we got to pay attention and try and find the little trail up to like where the clearing is because it's not a real trail yeah it's cool. like we're walking into the woods all right <laughs> so um so there was like a little trail right like a, li a, a little bit the way trail. it was described to me is like maybe just like sparse grass i don't know um so we'll figure it out wilderness explorers let's go <laughs> ready to direct those adventures man hey. as i'm approaching the scene i see shards of paper on the ground and i'm I'm like, I must be approaching the scene now. I picked them up and I can see what they are. The, these were pages or pieces of pages from obviously what must have been the pilot's notebook that they take, that it, they were maps of, air, air, of airfields and airports and that kind of thing from, you know, varied places in the country. And that's what I was running into. So I knew I was getting close. So as I'm approaching, my journalistic instinct kicks in. I've already heard on the radio that they're, going, they've, they're blocking access. They're not allowing anybody except emergency personnel in. I know that I am likely the only journalist that's going to be on site, on scene. Uh, I've already heard helicopters overhead. I suspect that's the Atlanta media, which later I find out it was. Uh, but I'm doubting that there's anybody else that, uh, <clears throat> that is going to hike in like I did. Uh, and so as I'm approaching, I'm fearful that as soon, because I've been through these situations before, uh, I'm fearful that as soon as I'm discovered to be there on site, that I'm going to be escorted off or asked to leave uh, the, the, the scene, especially since it's private property, it's not public property. Uh, even though I'm a faculty member there uh, at the time and advisor of publications. So as I'm approaching, I'm taking pictures of everything because I'm ex anticipating at any moment I might get bounced. Therefore, I want to come back with something rather than nothing. So I'm shooting everything I can. The captain had been known for like questionable like flying practices Good. like he didn't always do the checklist he didn't always do departure briefings like he did them sometimes but he was kind of like like his, some of his friends said that like he was like i've flown this plane for decades i know how to fly it i don't need to do that kind of stuff um well. but it's always important to do that kind of stuff to check before you go but the captain kind of had some questionable practices and the first officer was concerned about these practices and he was talking to his friends and co-workers about possibly reporting the captain to to like the faa and saying something about how he's not doing things correctly the first officer was concerned that if you went and reported the captain he would either get in trouble because he was also helping pilot when these things occurred or like it would kind of hurt his career because he wants to eventually become a captain and so he was kind of concerned that like people wouldn't hire him because he ratted out his coworkers. The captain was complaining to his friends that the first officer was kind of like 
a stickler to the rules and then the first officer was complaining that the captain didn't follow the rules. The initial plane sight crash, when the plane crashed into the mountain, you could see that it dug it up pretty good. And right as it laid right there was a foot severed without no shoes, no socks. In an airplane crash like that, especially with a jet, um, the speeds are so great that you have a, a wide area of dispersal of um, not only parts of the aircraft, but body parts also. So uh, we had to use chainsaws to get trees down to retrieve the bodies and body parts of a lot of them. As we approached up the mountain, we found body parts along the way, and mostly the way we found them was through smell, and because they'd be covered up in leaves. We'd uncover the leaves, and we'd try to mark it with a stick or a rock to let us know where that place is so we could come back and recover the pieces. And as I went up the mountain, you just it was just a chaos. It really it was just parts everywhere. When I walked on the crash site um, where it opened up, um, the first actual person we saw was, um, it was a male that was, um, in a tree. His torso was in a tree. Um, didn't have, and he didn't have head, arms, or legs. It was just a torso that was in a tree, stuck up probably about 25, 30 feet. Um, when you walk on past him a little bit, there was a seat out of the jet um, and it had a female torso and the female torso of course no arms or no legs uh, was there still belted into the seat of the jet. Me being the young guy at the time was assigned to uh, the female was trapped in a tree so I was assigned to get her down the best way I could and every time I would cut the tree it would hang up on another tree and parts of her body would fall off onto me. Uh, that sticks in my mind very much. And I would cut it and it would hang and I'd cut it and it'd hang. And I finally got it where it was leaning enough where I could crawl up it and sit and get her out of the tree. And then eventually I get to the scene. And at the top of the hill, leading down to the crash site, and I'm on the top of the ridge coming in on the trail from Fouché Gap. Uh, lo and behold, who is there but Bobby Abrams, our current chief of police, who at that time was, uh, I believe, a lieutenant, or number two of the police force. And Bobby's there, and I just walk up nonchalantly with my camera over my shoulder, acting like I absolutely should be there. I'm just expected to be there. Uh, and I engage in conversation with Bobby. How's it going? This is terrible. And we talk a little bit. And then, and there are other uh, law enforcement officials and uh, emergency rescue personnel, et cetera, that are on site. As soon as they see me kind of engaged with a buried police officer, they assume that I must, I'm supposed to be there. So then I go in back into my journalist mode and I kind of, I'm still being cautious. I'm trying to take pictures as best I can, and I start edging my way down the hill uh, to where I can see smoke coming up from where the, the crash site is. Uh, some things that I saw I'd rather not even repeat. It's uh, very graphic and, and not pleasant to even remember uh, and haunts me at times, to be quite honest. I think it's that way. So I think we just rounded this corner right here, and I think that's the like horse path off in that direction, so we need to head that way um, to go up to the mountain and it should be getting steep soon so All right. that'll be fun. <laughs> I'm wearing my adventure shirt though so everything's okay. I'm not. I don't actually know if this is it or not. 100% sure. How long have we been Bethana. here? Bethana! You're the tour guide. Come I'm sorry, I've never been here before. Because... <laughs> How far did we go? Honestly, I've No, 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 I think we're right here. And that, that this gray line is that path. Cause see how that kind of like curves around up there? I think, no, I think I, we're right here. No, cause if you look. Okay. 
see now it's triangle. Yeah, so we're kind of like right there. So. So that's probably that's probably just the point. Okay. Are you sure? So what's, what's the eye then? What does the eye mean? I mean, either way, I don't think that's the right way I to think go. It's this way. Right. Yeah. Either way, it's this way. How are we doing on time? Also. It's one forty-one. So we've, we've been out for a, a little under an hour, I, I think. I just gotta make sure we can head back with time so that we can get out. Because the thing closes at six. I will have plenty of time. Just wanna make sure. According to the um, accident report, the probable cause of the plane crash was the pilot's decision to trust a visual flight in a foggy mountainous area, as opposed to trusting instruments who, that could read the terrain for him. The pilot and the co-pilot knew that there was a mountain um, in the area, but they did not know where it was visually. They could not see it. Because it was foggy, the pilots didn't know where the mountain was, and they were afraid to turn too sharply away from it because there's an antenna on their other side which they didn't want to hit. And they were also afraid to go up because there were two planes that were landing in the Rome airport at the same time. And they were concerned about hitting them because they didn't know where they were. They were trusting their sight on a very foggy morning, but they couldn't see any potential danger ahead of them. When we got up there and started going in, we had gotten uh, the merchant management agency uh, notified them to get their volunteers in so we could have more bodies on the ground and put more boots in the woods to walk down and, and help work the site. I mean, we, had to, we had to basically canvas the entire crash area and walk shoulder to shoulder and, and look for body parts. Um, which, you know, now I'm the corner of Floyd County um, and doing that is my primary job now. But uh, when you go through like this, you have to identify the parts. Um, you determine which person that they may go to and then you bag them with that person. After we got up to the top of the mountain and we got the body bags all together and everything, just seeing them all laying there in the bags. Uh, I remember them bringing us supper, not lunch, supper, and nobody ate. Uh, we didn't even eat the rest of the day, we, even after we got home. You're always hopeful that you'll find someone still alive, uh, somebody that you can work with, but uh, when we got on the scene, we realized that that was gonna be an impossibility. Uh, we were just curiosity more than anything as to what we would see when we got up the mountain. Uh, if anybody be alive or anything. Uh, and it was very hectic trying to get up the mountain. You know, it's kind of a feeling of, uh, of helplessness, of loss. Um, and by that I mean that uh, even though we were there ready to work, we didn't have anything to work with. There was no one alive, no chance of anyone being alive. Um, the loss was we had all these people out there ready to work and do our job and save lives, and it was just a pure impossibility. It just was not gonna happen. Um, of course, you always have that little glimmer of hope back in the back of your mind that maybe somebody may have survived this, but you know, and when you come to reality, you realize that no one could have survived that crash. As I'm going down the hill, that's when I notice there are some personnel, uh, some rescue squad people that are coming up the hill and they're holding a body bag. And so I'm snapping away as they're pulling the body bag up. Uh, very disturbing, obviously. Somebody's lost their life. And as I, and I, and I take pictures of that, I start to progress down the hill yet a little further after snapping some of that. And I'm noticing, uh, I'm noticing debris even in some of the limbs of the trees, uh, a little bit of debris that has, has caught there. Uh, and then the smoke. At about that time, I'm not down to the site yet. I'm not even close down to the site yet. At that point, I am seen, discovered, and asked to leave by uh, other law enforcement personnel, non Barry. Uh, and so I go back to the top of the hill, again, try to engage with other officers up there. 
But that doesn't last very long before I'm asked to go on along my way. But by this time, I'm satisfied that I've done the best I can do as a journalist. Got the, got the long shot of the smoke coming up from the clearing. Got the body bags, unfortunately, being brought up, which tell the ultimate story of the result of the flight, which is that there, were, there was death. Uh, and that in this case, nine people died. Uh, and it is a tragic, tragic situation and, and story. So I can't even imagine how it impacted that family and that community in Birmingham uh, and the whole Bruno family uh, as, a, as a corporate entity too. Wyatt, how are you feeling? I'm not feeling too bad, actually. My, uh, my calves have only just now started feeling it just because we got to the incline that they told us about before. My breath is starting to get a little, to breathe a little bit more. I'm on my second thing of water, so hopefully I can, this amount of water will be enough to make it back down without running out. Whew. So Jack, how are you doing? Fan-freaking-tastic. Air is clear, we're high up in the air, sun shining, we got trees for some shade cover. Um, know my calves are getting toned, loving that. So um, yeah, feeling adventurous, ready to keep going, ready to see this plane crash site. Let's freaking do it. I'm so hyped. How are you, Beth Ann? I'm doing good. Um, I was worried that uh, I would lead us past the airplane site, but I've been kind of keeping tabs of where we are on the map, and I think we're doing really good. We're kind of in the home stretch right here, so pretty exciting. Mr. Cameraman, how are you, you feeling about this? You know, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about uh, the hike. I'm a little tired, but you know, my calves are really feeling it, and my arms from uh, carrying that camera, so All right. I don't know, I'm, I'm really excited to see this thing, so yeah. So we're here. And the crash site is somewhere right here. So we need to start paying attention um, to our left. We need to start paying attention to our left to, to see where we might see a clearing of where it could have been. So we're getting really close. So because we got there at 12.30, we thought that we had plenty of time before the gates closed at 6. So that we wouldn't have any issue um, while we were hiking. We would just focus on finding the plane crash and we didn't have to worry about time. However... <laughs> Um, so we like got incredibly lost. It looks like we're here. That's intense shit if we're right there. It, it can't be. Like, if, if, if we're here, then we're not seeing it. So we think we may have passed it, um, based on, like, our placement on Google Maps. So I'm just, I'm checking. Not, not that we're using Google Maps. No, 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 we're no. using our, our brains. Just yeah, no, we're the, real at Go our, the Google Maps in our head. It's like <laughs> sun directional. We're yeah, looking at the sun. Based we're on the direction of the sun and the shadows, we can tell that we may have passed it. So I'm checking the emails that I have of the directions to this place to see if we have. So. And by emails, she means. Uh, Carrier pigeons. Yeah, smoke signals so we can see just, just over the mountain there. We have a, we have a contact on the outside sending various smoke signals and uh, hawks. We're getting a bunch of hawk messages. We're using uh, emails. We're using emails, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, we're using emails. Okay, so it's like 2.40. What should we do if we can't find it on the way down? Like, doesn't doesn't the gate close at six? Yeah. Yeah. So like- We gotta get here by that point. Yeah, and I mean like if we're, if we get up to like where the plane crash is or like around where it would be and we still can't find it. It takes like an hour and a half to get back, right? Yeah. So like given giving taking like if try to find our way back and stuff, I'd give us over an hour and a half to get back. So maybe like between four and four thirty. We should probably start heading so back. Because we got we have to start heading back yeah, by we, four. we have to we have to start trekking back to the parking lot but like at some time between four and four thirty probably. So to if make it's it back on time. Four and we haven't found it yet, we have to turn around. Basically. Or maybe, maybe like four ten at the latest. Okay. If we're if we're like if we like think we have it or something like that. Just okay. so we've got an hour and 20, 15 minutes yeah. to, to find this to find this place. Okay, well, okay, yeah. well let's let's do this. Start yeah. going. <laughs> I don't, don't have that as much time anymore. Now, when you're talking about, what was it, nine people? Now, that, that becomes national news and certainly regional, major regional news. So uh, people ab absolutely are paying attention. Once the um, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board arrived, they, they recovered the people, of course. And then 
after that and all the other people came and they conducted their investigation and collected what they needed then they began to gather up the parts of the plane and best I remember it was probably five like, days it was five days it was several day process mm -hmm. of getting it all together National Transportation Safety Board um, it's an independent agency of the government, NTSB. They investigate all transportation accidents, especially aircraft incidents. Um, them, along with the FAA, which is Federal Aviation Administration, um, they work in conjunction and they'll both compile investigative reports. And their reports are independent of one another, but those reports have to be factual and comparative to come up with an actual reason for a cra reason a crash ha happened in the first place. And that's the way that they come up with pilot error on that incident, that the altimeter was never reset. So a jet the size of the Bruno Incorporated plane um, was not required to have a ground proximity warning system. At that time it was required for planes with 10 or more passengers. Now this warning system, if installed, would have warned the pilots 12 seconds before they hit the mountain that they were approaching uh, Lavender Mountain, which would have been enough time for the pilots to turn the plane around to avoid the crash. After this crash occurred, the National Transportation Safety Board um, required that all jets with six or more passengers um, are required to have this uh, warning system to avoid crashes like this in the future. The National Transportation Safety Board recommended to the Federal Aviation Administration that they re-examine their pre-flight um, safety procedures. The safety board also recommended to the FAA that they encourage their first officers to speak up more in the cockpit so that these kind of accidents do not happen in the future where the first officer doesn't say something in fear of overstepping their bounds. Okay, so if this area looks familiar to you, it's because we stopped and filmed here earlier and I think this is the real trail down to the uh, airplane site. So we went completely the wrong direction for a very long time. Uh, it's now, let's see what time is it now? Three o'clock. So we should probably start heading in that direction and hope, fingers crossed, that it's the right way. Does it look kind of like, I mean, like a path through the grass? I mean, it kind of does. I mean, kind of. It, se it seems like a little less of a path than... It's like less of a path than this is a path. Yeah. It, it, se it seems like a lot thinner and more grassy. And it's on flat land, so you can yeah. get down. Okay, so apparently we went the wrong way again. We actually were going the right the first time, and we just turned around for no reason. This clearly isn't the path to where we're supposed to be going. So we're gonna turn back around, keep walking, and walk past the point where we thought we were going the wrong way. Um, and hopefully we'll reach it. To save time, because we only have 50 minutes before we decide to turn around, um, we're gonna turn the camera off, put it in the bag, and just like book it up there and hope that we make it in time to film something. So see we you there. <laughs> yeah. So we got lost. And you'd think that walking in a straight line to a plane crash site would be an easy feat. Um, it was not. We kept thinking that we had reached the big curve that indicated that we had passed the plane crash site when in fact we hadn't actually even gotten close to the plane crash site. So we kept turning around in the hopes that we were turning in the right direction and we just got incredibly lost. We figured that it would take us about an hour, hour and a half to walk back to the truck and we were getting concerned because it was getting close to 435, which meant that if we turned around at that point, we'd make it just in time to be able to move the truck out of the parking lot. But we were nowhere close to the plane crash site. So there was no way we could go to the plane crash site and turn around and come back to the truck. We still have time to move it. The thing that stuck out to me most about the crash was the absolute professionalism of all the law enforcement and first responders and emergency personnel that were there. They worked together like uh, like a glove fits on my hand if it's properly sized. Uh, they, it was uh, it, it was poetry in motion, so to speak, and they they really did an exceptional job. Even though they kicked me off the scene, but. Uh, they they really did a, did a did a fine job, and and s respectfully treated those victims and their family members and such. So, yeah, uh, hats off to them. Well, you know, I had 
worked for the wrong police department, you know, prior to coming to Barry. So, you know, I experienced death before in many ways, you know, whether it be an automobile accident or suicide. Um, so the death wouldn't, you know, really a thing, but, you know, to see mangled bodies in the shape they were and knowing that there were nine and we didn't recover a lot of um, we, body parts. We recovered a lot of pieces of body parts. So it was, you know, had an impact on everybody. The good thing is, you know, we, we had a counseling session for all the first responders afterwards. I think it was very beneficial, but, you know, something you don't forget. It was very hard on our, every one of us up there. I was looking up to the older people how to handle what we were seeing, and our department did great. They sent us to a psychologist. Some talked, some didn't. Uh, but uh, you just learn to adapt. And while we was on the scene, we talked with each other. And the chiefs came talk to us. So you dealt with it through just communications, uh, being friends, everybody, family. A lot of them are not prepared mentally for what they encounter. Uh, we had a lot of people that were working that site, the police, fire, EMS, and all, that um, shortly thereafter, they rotated out and went into the private sector and got out of that type of work because it was, uh, it was more than they could handle. We had a lot of people that physically were, were sick because they, you know, of going out picking up body parts. They physically, some people just can't do that. You know, some people, like me, I can I can do it because I learned to build my defense mechanisms and and work with it and release it. I didn't have that experience of working for a police department dealing with that before that, but it was the second plane crash I'd been around, and you know, and I had seen death before, but it, it's never a good feeling. But it's you know, if you, if you work in this job long enough, you learn to just kind of deal with it, and you, you everybody deals with it in their own way. As a journalist, that journalist adrenaline kicks in. You're on the story, you're doing your job, but you're human at the same time. So you have these uh, these emotions that periodically are flooding you. You know, I know that in that body bag, that's somebody's dad, somebody's grandpa, somebody's brother, somebody's husband, or whatever the case may be. And so you can't help but think about that, even as you're in the midst of covering the story. However, you know, my, my work ethic and journalistic uh, principles and 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 uh, kick in, and so I'm doing I'm doing the job. I'm doing the work. All right. So this is where we believe the actual trail is up to where the crash site is. Um, so we're going to go up there and look around to see what it looks like today. Um, unfortunately, Jack and Wyatt had to turn around and move our truck because we were worried about being locked behind the gates that close at 6. So let's head up there and see what it looks like. Also at this time, because of a medical condition that Wyatt had, he was getting really fatigued and tired on this hike. And Jack was getting really concerned that his truck would get stuck behind the gate at Old Mill. So we made the decision to split up. So Jack and Wyatt turned around and went back to the truck to be able to move it um, out of the gate in time, while Eric and I continued on um, ahead to try and find the plane crash site. So we made a crucial error at this point. Eric and I walked away with less than half of a bottle of water between the two of us, and we had to hike up the mountain, film some stuff at the plane crash site, turn around, and walk all the way back. So there was probably two, two and a half hours of hiking up a steep mountain ahead of us, and we had less than a half of a bottle, bottle of water. So we think we've actually found the right site. Um, so the plane crashed in or around this area right here. So if you'll forgive me, I wanna read from my notes so I can get the times exactly right. The plane took off at 937. At 9.39 and 39 seconds, the captain advised the first officer, we're gonna to have to get away from that mountain pretty soon. At 9.40 and 35 seconds, the captain directed the first officer to slow her down a little. At 9.40 and 55 seconds, the cockpit voice recorder stopped recording. And at 9.41 and 21 seconds, an attempt to contact the plane was made by the Atlantis Center, but it failed.
So Eric and I have officially run out of water, so we're gonna turn around now to head down the mountain. Uh, but we won't be filming as we go down because we're just trying to get home as fast as we can. We were walking kind of quickly because we wanted to get to the bottom of the mountain as soon as possible because we were incredibly thirsty. So it probably took us about an hour to walk back down the mountain when it took us four hours to walk up the mountain. In total, um, Eric and I specifically walked for five hours and we walked eight miles, which was the length of the entire trail. When I went, originally I imagined that I was only gonna be walking maybe three miles total. Uh, we ended up walking eight in five hours uh, with very little water. All right, so what's, what's the deal? Well, we broke off from Bethann and Eric about hour and a half or so, maybe two hours ago. Um, Wyatt was having a little bit of struggle um, going up and we were worried that we were gonna run out of time because of all the crazy backtracking we did. So uh, Wyatt and I hiked back down before we got to go and see uh, the plane crash site, which kind of sucks, but it's okay. Um, we made it back in about an hour and we moved the car out of the place um, where they're gonna lock it up. So we're safe on that regard. Uh, and we made a cookout run. So you know what, life is good. Um, so we're waiting now for Bethany and Eric to come back down the mountain, hopefully with some uh, really awesome footage of the plane crash site. And we've got cookout waiting for them because we're good friends. So. Yeah. Should be back in about probably hour, hour, about an hour from now maybe. I'd say probably about an hour. Yeah, so, so like that. We're gonna, be, we're gonna be here for a while, hunker, hunkering down. You know what? From the comeback. I got fries and hush puppies and a big double burger. We're, so we're in an air conditioned car with water. Uh, so we're 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 living we're living. We are a, living we're large. We're living a, living you living like Larry. Stop that. <laughs> Turn off the camera. So on the hike down, all we were thinking about was uh, the water and the food that we were going to be eating, um, which is why there's no footage of Eric and I walking down the mountain because we were trying to get down as quickly as possible because we were incredibly tired and exhausted at the end of our journey. We didn't get this on footage and I kind of wish we did, but but when Eric and I reached uh, Jack's truck, we jumped in and without saying a single word, uh, we grabbed the water bottles that were designated to us and we just drank the entire thing. Um, and you know, Jack and Y were asking us about the, how the hike was, how was the plane crash site, and we did not say anything. <laughs> we just kept drinking water because we were so thirsty. Um, I think all in all, it was a really good hike. It was um, it was really interesting to be able to go up to to see a location of such a tragic event. I wish that we were able to find um, some wreckage that was still there because I was told by a couple of people that I talked to um, that there were some parts of the plane that were still there. So maybe I'll go back again and, and look for the um, pieces of the plane crash. Um, if I do go again, I'll make sure I bring more water and, and now I know where it is so I won't get lost. Um, you know, but it was, um, you know, there's sights and smells that you won't ever forget. Uh, it was a grotesque scene, so. It was nighttime when I saw it. I was involved in staying up there at night as part of the security detail over it. And um, so we didn't see as much as they did in the daytime. Obviously, you still have the, the smells and you know what went on and all that. And it's, it, you know, not something you ever want to see again. You know that when you get on the site that there's nothing you can do. Uh, there's not going to be any survivors. Uh, you're doing body recovery. Um, uh, the biggest thing that impacts you are the personal items that were there. There are a lot of personal effects off the jet from the people that were on it, you know, scattered about. And uh, that's another thing we had to go through and gather up and, you know, turn that over to a forensic team to be sectioned out and turn back to families. But that was probably one of the biggest things, um, just all the personal effects that were there because that kind of, the torso, you know, extremities, the heads, things like that, you know, you are you kind of remember them and know them, but the personal effects, that personalizes that incident to an actual individual. One of the things that we always talk about 
is the red buttons. There was a Christmas tour. The company was going store to store, visiting stores, and they had a lot of marketing stuff on there and they had these little red pins. And I just, when we talk about just how they were always, they were everywhere on the scene. You know, wherever you look, they were there. Not only am I thinking about those victims and the family members and that that's someone's dad, grandpa, brother, etc., but then I'm thinking about some of the images that I saw and the horrifying graphic things that I don't ever want to think about again. But you, thankfully, it's very rarely these days, but even now, every once in a blue moon in the evening, you know, at four o'clock in the morning, I might wake up and remember, because I've had a dream about that, that it's, yeah, not something you want to think about. One female that was trapped in the tree probably has played on my mind for years and still does. I mean, I remember it vividly and I've gone on so many calls that I tend to forget, but that one I will never forget. Thank you.